Let me see if this actually is working. I hit the button. It's working yet. Looks like it is. <laughs> Took a little while, but we got there. So, it's been a pretty wild ride this morning. I've had the hardest time getting my plumber back over here. And of course he's available five minutes before the show is gonna start. And I was just thinking like the last time that I had an event here, the tanks showed up right at the start of the event. So right now my plumber is downstairs. He's taking some measurements and, and things of that sort. Um, but we still do need to like talk. So I might have to like excuse myself for a few minutes every now and again, answer some questions, pop up here, answer some of your questions. And yeah, I was just thinking, considering that at the barbecue, my tanks showed up and I'm starting this live stream, this which is like literally the, the next event that I had and the, the plumber shows up, I'm just thinking, you know, maybe I just need to have more events. That way more stuff will get done around here. All right, guys, let's start real quick on the actual corals themselves. Hopefully when I switch over to the actual live show with the corals, it won't bomb out. There we go, looks halfway decent. I had a slight technical difficulty shooting this live show and hopefully it's not incredibly noticeable but uh, it was noticeable enough when I was editing it that I pretty much had to send back my motorized slider for repair. Now my motorized slider has been a workhorse professional piece of equipment for a really long time. I bought it about five years ago and it's pretty much worked near flawlessly until now. So the entire time, this slider for years has lived in my greenhouse, getting dust and pollen. I'd clean it out occasionally, but I mean, most other electronics and most other you know, pieces of gear like that had pretty much rotted and died in that same amount of time. So. This is like an ultra precision uh, device that's kind of um, really sensitive to any kind of weirdness going on as far as like how, how clean it is. So finally, it's like, no, this has to go back. Like the, the sort of thing I'm seeing, it's not acceptable video wise. So unfortunately, this is the last live show I shot before the big maintenance. So apologize in advance always some some amount of technical difficulties I am just glad that the live stream worked just getting to this point uh, I was legit concerned that I would hit this button and then nothing would happen on your guys end okay so welcome guys welcome hello everyone a little late on the highs and hellos Uh, let's see, just catching up on some of the chat. Uh, Diacanthus, if he wasn't so busy, I'd be interested to hear his thoughts on approaching your setups from a plumbing perspective. He's literally thinking about that right now, downstairs. Yeah, but here's the thing, you know what's crazy? Everybody is super busy. Everybody associated with this project is super busy to the point that it's very hard to get anybody to show up. Now, part of that is like, it's very, very frustrating. But the reality of the situation is the other option that you have is to just go with some, somebody else to do the work. Now, that's a huge risk because there's, uh, there are definitely some contractors that worked here on this building that simply put, didn't do that good of a job. Uh, a handful of them, in fact. And I'm at least to the point where 
the work that's getting done, I'm fairly confident is done well. And I couldn't say that in the past about certain parts of the project. So at least I have that. Also, if I were to, to just call up some electricians and plumbers and carpenters and they're available to work tomorrow, that's not necessarily a good sign either because the really good ones are pretty much booked 12 months in advance. So I kind of just have to stick with the extended time frame, but I can't complain too much. He's downstairs right now. All right, so homegrown reefer. I'm new to buying on here. First time, how does this work? Okay, so in order to actually purchase corals, you have to go to titlegardens.com and there is a link there on the front page to the live, to the live show itself. Uh, and in fact, I think that occasionally we even put up a little graphic that says, you know, go to titlegardens.com slash live. And you'll see, for example, item number eight show up, these red people eater pallies. And if you wanted item number eight, you just throw it into your shopping cart just like it's any other item. And once you're done with the, with the whole shopping procedure, and you can, you can mix and match stuff from the website as well as stuff that you see on this live show. And when you're ready, you can check out. Uh, it, the shipping is $39.99 flat rate all over the country. But if you are over $250, shipping is free. Um, in order to actually get the coral, you have to complete the checkout process. So during the live show, sometimes the live shows can get kind of competitive on which corals people are going after. It's a good idea to check out every single time and it, to avoid like multiple instances of shipping that shipping charged, uh, what you can do is select just adding to another order. And once you're all done, make sure that you either have the $39.99 flat rate or you're above the $250 threshold. So hopefully uh, that helps. Uh, Robert Rayworth, uh, unfortunately we do not ship to the UK. This is uh, US only. Deacanthus, I agree, booked schedule is usually a good sign in terms of quality. And you know what's crazy? It's like these uh, the contractors that I'm currently working with, it's like the finished carpenter, it's the plumber, it's a couple others actually. Uh, it's amazing that like they've been working here for two years so it's not like I'm not a priority like we've given a ton of work to these guys and they're on the books for a ton more work it's they're just simply that busy like for example uh, this has happened twice now that I literally have a check waiting for a particular uh, contractor and all they have to do is come and get it it's like, you know, the next time you guys come, because you have a, a ton of work still left to do, all you need to do is show up, you guys get the check. These checks are five-figure checks, okay? Now, if you had a five-figure check, I don't know what everyone's economic standing is, but at least I know that if I had a five-figure check that I needed to go pick up 20 minutes away, I would probably make it a point to go get that. But two different contractors literally took two weeks to a month to come pick up that check. So it's not even like, oh, I know how to get uh, contractors to show up. You just don't pay them and then they'll come. No, they don't come even when you're trying to pay them. So, so when he said, I can show up today and it'll be slightly before your show, I'm like, come on over. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, take, I'll take whatever I can get as far as scheduling goes. Okay, John McDonald, are corals listed randomly or as categories? Seems to be the case so far, not interested in zoos. When can I come back? We do have them in segments and uh, it is broken up slightly. So you might see like a patch of zoas and then onto some LPS, some SPS, and then you might see a patch of zoas again, things like that. So I would, I, if I had to guess, uh, there's probably, it's probably broken up into batches of around 10 to 20, if I had to guess. Eco Marines, evening, hello. Okay. I better check real quick 
Give me two minutes. I'm going to see if uh, Plummer has any questions. I'll be right back up. One second. And I'm back. Oh, let's see. Intro to reefing. What do you do with stuff that doesn't sell in the live show? Do you put it on the next one or just wait a bit and try to sell later? Uh, it's just in our tanks, just like anything else. So it just goes right back in inventory. Nothing really too special there. So there's a little bit of a discount, I guess, on the live sale stuff. So it's like, for example, this Fascination Five, I forget exactly what it is on the website, it might be like 50 or 60 bucks. So it would just it join its brethren right back on the site, I guess. Okay, let's see. Donnie B, how long should you wait to remove a frag from a plug? I always get nervous that it's going to uh, encrypt over it too much. So that encrusting action. Like, for example, like I'm looking at these Favia, for example. Oh, and I apologize, there's a little typo there, five Hellrider. No, it's like Hellrider Favia. There's five units available. Um, so this piece is pretty much already encrusted and like trying to remove it at that point, it's not gonna work out that well. At, once it gets to about like something that looks like that, I would just recommend setting it down and letting it continue to encrust all over the rock and everything. Now, if you look at this prism favia here where the flesh hasn't connected back down into the, the plug at all, this is fairly trivial to then pop off. But if you already see it like growing down onto the plug, at that point you can probably start propagating it even. Just break the plug apart and you probably will get several different cuttings of it. It's funny, it feels like when the teacher would leave the room in school. Yeah, there's a little bit of that. I had to go downstairs and ask, answer some questions about about some return pumps and things like that. Because right now uh, we're planning all the different stuff with plumbing the aquariums. And uh, it's, you know, plumbing one aquarium usually isn't that big of a deal. But plumbing like a handful of really large aquariums that involve closed loops, it involves you know, lo long runs of, um, of fairly substantial pipe. You don't really want to have like a whole bunch of excess because like, uh, I don't know what schedule 83 inch 
pipe is, but I know it's probably like, I don't know, like $5 to $10 a foot maybe. Probably need like a mile of it. Who knows? It's gonna be a it's gonna be a big bill one day. So as much as possible, you want to avoid having a lot of waste there, and you want to avoid needing a lot of valves and stuff. Because once you start talking about three inch schedule 80 valves, you're talking about hundreds of dollars per valve. So you want to avoid that too. You know. What's strange, John? John Phelan is uh, just talking about uh, dinoflagellates. I guess, knock on wood, I've been very fortunate that I haven't had to deal with dinoflagellates. Um, for whatever reason, at the greenhouse, it's that's just never really been a thing. I, I wish I could even give you some some advice on how to deal with that, but it's it's not something that I've had any experience with. I've had plenty of experiences dealing with a whole bunch of other things, but. Uh, I guess fortunately for me, dinoflagellates hasn't really been one of those things. <sighs> yeah, as far as like a timetable for when these aquariums are going to be ready, I am not really sure. We're just, again, he's uh, the plumber is downstairs right now, just measuring stuff out, making just like a, a list like an order list because we're at the point where we have to, to to look whether it makes sense to order in mega bulk from the directly from the company because we might actually be able to so once all the entire part list and all the measurements are all in we're gonna kind of like take a look at that and then there's gonna be a waiting game just to get all that material here then it's going to be uh, another waiting game to get the, the plumber and his crew to put this all together for us. Theoretically, I could plumb it, but like I've said in the past, I have no interest in doing plumbing now that I know that like how, how well it's done by professionals versus something that I would do. No interest at all. Torch MMA Empire. I've been reading horror stories about people going to the hospital uh, because of palytoxin poisoning. I'm afraid to even maintain or groom my zoas. So there's a couple of things about that. So first off, most things uh, as far as like zoas and pallies go. Let's start with that. Zoas and pallies. A lot of what's called a pally in this hobby isn't a pally at all. There's actually very few paleothella. So there's kind of that uh, that uh, brownish, greenish, maybe even like grayish stuff. Some people call it like Texas trash or whatever. So that's a paleothella. There's paleothella grandis. There are nuclear greens, purple deaths, that sort of thing. Then there are these zoas that just happen to have really large polyps. And oftentimes, those really big polyp zoas get called pallies. Now, some zoas are also capable of ha having uh, palytoxin, but not nearly as much as actual paleothoa. So if you're going to have like a bunch of paleothoa and you want to run it all through a blender and kill yourself, that is one thing. But you might like have tons and tons and tons of zoas and really not have any risk of palytoxin poisoning. Now, you could always just play it safe, wear gloves, or not even introduce pallies or zoas of any kind into your tanks. But I think that the concern about it might be a little bit overblown. Having said that, I'm pretty sure that my mom got palytoxin poisoning because one time she was complaining about uh, like uh, just having like the cold sweats at night and not being able to um, to go to sleep and just like racked with like headache and pain okay that's a good sign of palytoxin poisoning it's um the, especially the the cold sweats part i hear over and over and over again because one time i had sold a large quantity of paleothoa to um a wholesaler and somehow when when they went to propagate these things they just had like a new guy 
and the new guy just ran this stuff through like a, a bandsaw, just like it was any other coral. And by doing so, that got every single person at that company sick. Even the people working upstairs on the computer, they got sick. One guy did have to go to the hospital. I mean, to, to some degree, I think that consumers should be aware. If you're in the trade, you, you'd better know. You'd be, you, you should know better. So anyway, they almost all died. But yeah, I, mean, I guess like don't run corals that might be toxic through a saw and blow it all over your building. So Harkins says, <clears throat> I frag pallies with a full face respirator um, and, and wears gloves. Good advice, good advice, bad advice that I could give, I don't know. But we practically never do that. Uh, let's see, uh, kind of, so I'm going back into chat just a little bit, Adventures in Reefing. Did the electrical for the lighting ever get sorted? Um, so the original electricians are not invited back to do anything more. They've done clown show level work up to this point. I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again. They wired outlets in the in the bathrooms at 220 volt. And at one point, uh, my full-time guy here, Ben, was trying to screw in a light bulb, and he couldn't find exactly where the the mount point was for the light bulb, and he, and he stuck his finger down in there and got and got zapped. And you know, whenever you do that, it's it it it's, it sucks, right? And he was just like, "Man, it just that hurts so bad." I'm like. I guess it hurts a little bit, but it's not supposed to hurt like really bad, right? When you stick your hand, your finger into like a, a light socket. Well, it hurts really bad if it's wired at 220. Also, like other uh, carpenters were plugging their tools into the 220 lines in the bathroom, and their their vacuum cleaners and and whatever else so they're plugging in was getting damaged. So not the greatest experience with these electricians. And the final straw was the lighting situation where uh, we should have about eight separate circuits of lighting. We have something closer to three because it was just all done wrong. So what we're going to have to do is run basically a dozen new legs of, of wiring and everything. Now, here's where uh, a healthy dose of don't trust anybody comes into play. I had built this entire building in like in such a way that if there's screw ups, I have some opportunity to fix it. So we have these like channels where they're just like utility channels. And if I ever need to do more plumbing, if I ever need to do more electrical, if I ever need to more, run more data cable, whatever, I can run it through these 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 uh, accessible channels going all the way down the green uh, down not the greenhouse the warehouse. So we will be making good use of those in order to redo all the uh, lighting outlets. Uh, Greg Reefboy, hey Than, ever think about having a Halloween picnic? Instead of dunking for apples, maybe we dunk for Dunkins. <laughs> Again, somebody's gonna have a mouthful of Paleothoa and I'm gonna be liable, so no. Uh, John Evans, why do we see uh, many more hammer corals and not frog spawn in the hobby? Don't know if that's even true or not. There's a there's plenty of people that are um, that are really into frog spawn. Uh, Euphily in general are the, the hot commodity right now. People are paying lots of money for for Euphilia. Uh, King of Soul says the Indonesia ban has a lot to do with it. Um, yeah, uh, to some degree. So uh, a, a lot of the really popular frog spawn did come from Indonesia and the varieties that are, are available from Australia tend to not be branching in, in nature. They tend to be more wall and those you can't propagate as easily. Sometimes cutting those you might run into a lot of issues with cutting a wall. So they're not I guess quite as quite as desirable and they're crazy expensive on top of that. Hmm. 
Are there other poisonous corals that get outshined by pallies or are pallies dead? Um, so intro to reefing, no, there are other poisonous corals. Um, so poisonous means that you put it into your mouth and you get poisoned. Venomous is it stings you basically. And so there's plenty of corals that can sting the heck out of you. And some people have allergic reactions to certain coral stings. So for example, um, like massive carpet anemones have a very, very sticky, uh, grippy nematocyst. And so when you uh, touch one of those things, they latch onto you and sometimes they even leave their tentacles stuck on you. And um, some, some folks have such an allergic reaction to that that they could die. The, the only time that I got stung really badly was on like the thinner part of my skin. And I'm pretty sure that I immediately felt it in my heart when, when that happened. So there are things out there that are like highly venomous that, that you might have a, a bad reaction to. But as far as, uh, as the poisonous end of the spectrum, uh, palytoxin is one of the most deadly neurotoxins uh, from like a pharmacological perspective. So I don't think anything really compares to that. Having said that, I wouldn't be in a huge hurry to start licking all your corals. It's probably not a great idea. Jeffrey Hammer, I'm a roofer and know better. I don't know what the context is. I'm gonna guess that, uh, yeah. I don't know, probably something that my electricians messed up with. I touched a 220 electric fence. That was a surprise. 220 can kill people. Like people die all the time all around the world that where 220 is the standard. I guess like the, the thing about one or 110 is that when you get zapped, the, the immediate thing is like recoil and your hand goes away. I guess 220, sometimes like you're, you automatically want to grip whatever, whatever it is. Like that's how it affects uh, affects your body and when that happens you can't let go so that's kind of how people get fried those channels are called chases yes Mike thank you yes I have a couple of chases uh, Sarcat will turbo snails eat macroalgae no not really so um, the microalgae stuff they do a great job with um, but macroalgae, usually people rely on either fish or sea urchins. I've become a lot more interested in sea urchins lately. Um, if they can do the do a job better than some of these larger fish, I might go that route. Because once uh, my fox faces and tangs get to be a certain size, they're a real pain in the butt. They either get hyper aggressive or they get munchy on random things that they shouldn't be munchy about. Shouldn't be eating acans, for example. Okay, lame UFO. What corals would you choose if starting a small frag farm again from scratch? Uh, let's see, you're gonna wanna stick with stuff. I think invariably it's gonna come down to what you can personally grow. Not everybody can just grow tons of Acropora, for example. But I would stick to stuff that you can actively propagate. I would stay a little bit further away from stuff, even if it's like a super hot commodity, of stuff that's just going to take you months and months and months and months to grow. Like, um, it'd be amazing to be uh, growing gold torches, for example. In the time that it'll take you to get extra heads of gold torch, you could have made 50 times that amount of money on stuff that you could have propagated more frequently. So, that. Let's see. Greg, nice velvet corals. No one knows what you're talking about. Uh, it's not so much the voltage, but more the amps that will kill you. Yeah. The urchins will decorate themselves in frags. And yeah, that's, that's true too. That the bulldozer aspect of, of these things is something that I'm not that thrilled about about urchins. We've got like a couple of urchins and they did do that immediately, but at the same time, the tanks that have the urchins in it, I've noticed, do get ridiculously clean. The, 
the recoil can't happen without the dead space in the wave. So with three phase and DC, there's always current. Okay, so Tom, yeah, we have three phase here, but I don't think any of our, well, we have one device that's actually wired at three phase. That's the air conditioner. Everything else is just, is just a single phase. Thank goodness. Didn't want to kill Ben or anything with a light socket. So Gabriel Berkey is asking, I have these tiny tube-like growths all over my rocks that snap off if to touch them. What the heck are they? Uh, that sounds like kind of a, like a colonial um, feather duster. Heard pincushion urchins were pretty good. I think most urchins, uh, like the tuxedos, pincushions, I think they all do a pretty good job when it comes to algae control. And uh, I've heard that the, the smaller ones do the best job. But once they get bigger, you run into like the bulldozer issues, and that's when um, they might need to get rehomed or something into some larger container. Oh. So I did tell my plumbers, like, if you have any questions, come interrupt me. And so far, I have heard nothing. So hopefully, he's planning. He's planning my systems well. So, Lycos34 previously asked, nutrients are low, but I have bryopsis. Any good bryopsis eaters? Not really, no. Bryopsis is one of those things that there's not a lot of appetite for. Like, a lot of fish won't touch it or anything like that. It's one of those things that you're probably going to have to physically remove yourself as long as you can and try to deal with the overall chemistry of your aquarium. Um, in that sense, you were looking at uh, we're looking at drawing a total blank, just doing more water changes, doing a little bit more active chemical filtration, act activated carbon and whatnot. But there's a really good chance that what is feeding that is maybe something even leaching from your live rock. So it's not necessarily uh, you know something that you've actively uh, you know fed in. So it's not really necessarily your food or anything like that. So sometimes it is just depleting the supply of whatever it needs to grow on. <laughs> so, uh, so Deacanthus Reef, yes, please come and interrupt us so we can soak up some plumbing wisdom. Oh, he could you could talk your ear off. What's funny is he what, he came to the barbecue here, the the one that was at the end of July, and nobody knew that it was him. So nobody like talked to him about it, and it's like only after the fact that they're realizing, oh. He was there, and, I'm, and I was surprised. Like he didn't mention that he was the plumber, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think that he would be uh, a huge crowd pleaser if you know people knew who he was, knew what he's what he's, the work that he's done here, and wanted to pick his brain about uh, about plumbing because he can he can talk about plumbing forever. Uh, intro to reefing. Do you know if lettuce slugs are good algae eaters? I don't know if they are. Somehow I ended up with one. I don't remember how I got it even. I th Somebody must have given it to us or something, but we've got one. He's about like this big and he's in a 300 gallon tank. So I don't really notice what he's done. Uh, I'm kind of racist towards nudie Bronx though. I think I've had such a bad experience with Montipora eating nudie Bronx that it's kind of like colored my entire impression of the entire, uh, what is that, even a, a class of organisms that most of which I'm sure are fine. It's just like this, those, uh, when they become a pest, they're so resilient. But at the same time, I bet like if you got like a super decorative one and try to keep it in your tank, it'll be just like dead in two weeks. But the ones that you don't want to, to keep alive are impossible to get rid of. No, but I do have a lettuce nudie bronc. Seems okay. Uh, lame UFO. 
asks, can you explain the correlation between nutrient alkalinity and light? Um, not really sure if they're gonna, you're gonna have that much of a correlation there. Um, so when you're talking, cause, cause all three can really be handled quite independently. When it comes to lighting, uh, there's like what that that's like a two hour talk just on lighting right i would if if i was to hedge on anything i'd go a little bit less on lighting until you have accumulated some species that are extremely light demanding and you'll kind of know that when you're there like things like montipora can take in a quite a bit of light acropora that sort of stuff most everything else does fairly well in lower light alkalinity uh if you're if you're hovering on 8.5, just go for stability. I wouldn't try to tweak ALK too much. It's, it's all about just keeping it steady. Even if it's low, I would say keep it steady rather than trying to increase it too quickly. Uh, and as far as just like overall nutrient, I'm thinking about like feeding and adding aminos and everything like that. I'm of the, of the opinion that more food is beneficial until you've overfed and then all hell breaks loose. So that's kind of something that you have to play with, but at the same time, you don't want to completely go overboard with it. Now in our systems, we've been very fortunate so far that we don't typically run into that, um, that overfeeding situation. But I do know that when, um, I guess if this is, maybe this is a correlation that you're looking for, but for us going from winter to spring, always precipitates a an algae crisis of some sort because the um, the amount that we're feeding doesn't really change but the entire system kind of acclimates itself to that level of nutrient and then when spring hits uh, the amount of sunlight that is now available it's it's way more intense and it's up in the sky way longer so uh, I would say that there might be, I don't know, a fourfold increase in lighting, and that's when the algae tends to take off, even when we're basically trying to keep everything else steady. Don't know if that answered your question, but those are some of my thoughts on it. What type of food mix do you feed your corals? So we, okay, we changed something recently. We have a bunch, and I mean a bunch of pellets and powders and stuff like that. I couldn't even name them all out for you. There's, there's like some coral frenzy, there's some omega, there's some polyblab stuff, just a bunch of different stuff. And uh, what else do we have? We have some Hakari in there. We mixed up all that stuff. Then, separately, I mix up my own batch of frozen food, which consists of different types of krill, mysis, and certain types of plankton like rotifers and... Cyclopes, things like that. So that's all the frozen stuff. And then we have this mix of also the powdered stuff. And all that together seems to do really nicely. As far as frequency, uh, we instead of just feeding like one big thing per day, I've kind of gone towards feeding multiple times per day. And that's kind of helped out a lot too, because it's really spurred on um, the feeding behavior of a lot of the corals to be just a lot more receptive to feeding throughout the entire day. And also, um, just the fish respond better to more frequent feedings. Because, um, you know, their, their stomachs are itty bitty tiny. And just having them gorge for like 20 minutes and then nothing for the rest of the day isn't that great for them. So I, I'm all about multiple feedings per day um, and feed as much as you can without crashing your system, essentially. One of these days, I'm going to have to do a video on um, sun corals, like those non-photosynthetic guys. We don't ever sell them. Um, the reason is we finally figured out how it, how it works for us to keep them alive. And uh, spoiler, it's feed them all the time. So pretty much we have this little thing of that, that mix of frozen and powdered foods and everything like that sitting right there by the tank. And every time anybody wants to walk by and, and give that coral a, uh, a squirt of food is fine. So the coral probably gets fed 30 to 50 times a day, just 
all the time, constantly feeding. And for the first time in my whole life, I'm actually able to get this thing to grow additional heads and stuff. We're just constantly feeding it. Uh, let's see. Decanthus is saying, definitely watch and listen if he finds the time. That'll be never. <laughs> uh, he's probably uh, he's probably lucky. He didn't mention that he, he was the plumber poor guy who had been harassed with constant questions. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. Uh, Sarcat, are there snails that breed in the reef tank? Yes, there are plenty that do. Uh, Mainly, it's like the hitchhiker stuff, like Stomatellavaria. The stuff that I wish bred more in my tanks, that seems to breed in everybody else's, is arguably the best snail, and that's trochuses. Trochuses are expensive and they're hard to ship, but they do a really good job and they do breed in captivity. Casey, when you have to pee, but the corals are only on display for 30 seconds at a time. So my mom is trying to convince me to put them on there for only 10 seconds at a time. I'm like, I think 35 seconds is fine. Michael Porter, what can you tell me about the blue pavona? So there's an entire video all about pavona that we did. Uh, long story short, it's an encrusting coral. It doesn't require a ton in the way of lighting or flow or anything like that. It's fast growing and it'll be aggressive to stuff that gets in its proximity so you kind of have to plan out some um, some space for it it's very fluorescent and it's one of the thing one of the few corals that actually glows a blue color it's very cool mike howard i'm so looking forward to tank builds you and me both <laughs> you and me both but i think that we've got quite a bit longer to wait I'm just thinking, yeah, it's like the longer I wait, it's, that's costing me like a lot of money. But, you know, what are you going to do? Am I going to hire a less good plumber or plumb it less good myself? That's another thing. When, uh, when I get all of, the, all of the plumbing parts and everything like that, the last thing I need is for me to mess up uh, a valve or mess up like a long section of pipe because, again, this stuff, like... I didn't really fully appreciate how expensive um, plumbing was because I was I, I did stuff on a it's not a small scale but the stuff at the greenhouse it's all like schedule 40 it's all inch inch and a quarter maybe not the biggest deal in the world but once you go up to schedule 80 for everything and have to work with large diameter pipe uh, you don't want to mess that up so I would rather have somebody else potentially mess that up and then have to take care of it rather than me having to then pony up because I screwed up a three inch schedule 80 gate valve, which costs like $600 or something like that. Don't want anything to do with that. <sighs> Meldope Music, one of the best YouTube channels out there. Glad I caught this live. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. Andy Fleischer, is the coral footage pre-recorded? Yes, I shot this uh, last couple of days. Uh, and I'm looking at like item number 72 right now, and you can kind of see this little annoying jitter. That was a technical difficulty that, that I was having with my slider that's been in my greenhouse now for five years, and this is the first time I've ever had to like send it in for maintenance. But yeah, I, once I started to see that, I'm like, oh boy. It's, it's lasted so long without having any issues, but now it's got to go back. Yeah, so I shoot everything in advance. Like all these corals are st still sitting there. They're going to be sitting there starting next week when I start shipping this all out. But yeah, all of this stuff is pre-recorded. That's that way that I can get all the, um, all the different overlays on. And then I can also do the special effect where um, I change the color temperature to kind of give you an idea of what it looks like under different lighting. So the lighting starts off at kind of like a daylight-ish 6500 Kelvin, and then it goes all the way to a more actinic um, like 18,000 Kelvin. Uh, Gabriel's asking, thoughts on dosing amino acid? Heard it makes a huge difference in color and growth. So Gabriel, um, 
I've tried it on and off, but it's hard for me to tell if there's any one thing that does anything. Because, you know, things change, and especially since my systems are in a greenhouse, I can't like scientifically say, this is great. Because what could have happened was there was a ton of pollen that just flew into my greenhouse and did all kinds of weird stuff, good or bad, right? So sometimes it's like, oh, I've got a ton of pollen. My corals look like garbage. I'm also happen to be feeding amino acids. This isn't working out. But uh, I have noticed totally anecdotally that the amino acids help my SPS tank. And um, we are going to be getting more into doing that, that, that feeding of aminos. Now, Bulk Reef Supply did a video on that topic recently. They have some, some really good results, some really exciting results. And um, yeah, the only thing that would be kind of a hindrance for me would be the sheer quantity that I would have to use. And I'd have to like, I'm sure it does make financial sense to do so, but I'd, I'd have to, to actually dig into it because we could go through an entire bottle a week and that does get expensive a little while, after a little while. Click Clax Reef, hi Harkins. Uh, is there a way to obtain stomatella, or is trochus just better? Uh, stomatella are pretty much going to come in on new corals and new rock all the time. You're going to have a harder time not having them in your tank. They don't really do a whole lot, though. I mean, they they do graze, but it's not like not like a trochus. A trochus does a really good job. What part do I keep chalices at? So Rob is asking. Um, I would say between 50 to 100. Nothing too crazy. Hikari just came out with a new coral food. I'm sure they did a really good job too. I, I've got a I've got a lot of um, appreciation for Hikari over the years. Um, Japanese company has like a long history in uh, feeding koi, like the really expensive guys. And um, from everything that I've heard about them behind the scenes, they are serious business when it comes to to making food. Universe geckos. How do you ship corals? It's kind of a process. Uh, we ship them, especially well, we ship frags mainly in a like a four ounce urine cup, and we attach these guys upside down to a piece of styrofoam. Not really. It's not styrofoam. It's closed cell poly, and that way it it holds together. It is completely watertight, so it doesn't lose its buoyancy. It's inert, and um, we, it basically is there just to hold that thing in place because we've noticed that corals sometimes struggle during the shipping process just because of how violently they're being shaken back and forth during shipping. Um, and by kind of securing it in one location, it doesn't really get impacted as much by that, that shakiness of the transit. Uh, after that, uh, so here's something that's kind of creepy. Urine cups don't seal very well. <laughs> Of all the containers that you want to seal really well, a urine cup is probably one of those things, but they don't seal that well. So after we get done tightening down the lid, uh, we then um, put that into a small plastic, like a two mil plastic bag, and then we uh, staple that guy shut with the bag stapler. If you guys are unfamiliar with what I'm talking about with the bag stapler, they are God's gift to packing corals. Uh, it makes a perfectly watertight seal and you are more likely to blow out the back of the bag than have water leak out of the part that got stapled. After that, it goes into a styrofoam box and gets shipped next to air. So Meg1473 is asking, new to the hobby, and my zoas were happy, but now the middle of the colony won't open anymore. What should I do? Dipping didn't help. Any other thoughts? So you might want to continue doing the dipping for a little while and observe really closely to see if there is a pest of some sort messing with it. Because zoanthids are like the ideal target for pests. Pests love to munch on zoas. There's all different types. There's nudibranch, there's sea spiders, there's snails, like the, certain fish 
a lot of stuff really like ZOAs, right? After all this talk about Palitox and how dangerous everything is, it's like ZOAs are the thing that a lot of, of, of uh, critters out there always like to make a meal of. So I have this inclination that it might be something pest related. It could be something disease related. They also come down with certain ailments like Zoa pox and things like that. So the number one thing you can do for Zoas is to keep them clean, uh, give them plenty of flow to make sure that no uh, detritus settles on them, make sure that there's no nothing actively eating them. And sometimes it is just a matter of every single day taking a turkey baster and blowing them off aggressively and just like making sure that whatever is settling on them gets dislodged. If that's not enough, uh, you can, this is a hyper aggressive way to deal with it, but you might even give it like a, a, a one minute bath in fresh water. It's the only coral I would suggest doing that with is Zoas, but that will definitely knock stuff off of it and uh, give you a chance to, to really clean it thoroughly. Now, when you do that, expect that it's going to stay closed for about three days. They don't like that. Nothing likes that. That's why it works. Okay, Neil Pelling is asking, what are your thoughts on running nitrates above PPM? So nitrates, we, we have high nitrates, and not because it's particularly intentional. It's just kind of what it is. The effort to lower nitrates here would be kind of counterproductive. So pretty much anything from like five to 25, I think it's a safe zone to be playing in. Like a lot less than five, um, I kind of worry about coral starvation issues. Uh, you know, some people like freak out if their nitrates are above like one. I'm like, if it's lower than five, I, I start to worry. And above 25, I start to worry. Like right around like 45, 50, 80, that's when you're going to have some serious issues. Brian, I'm not going to butcher your last name. Uh, favorite fast growing corals. I would have to say right now, my favorite fast growing coral. It's probably Acropora. I know it's such a boring answer, but it probably is. It's that there's so much variety out there. Montipora is up there too, um, but Acros I like a lot. I'm, I'm actually excited to get the tanks downstairs done so that I can make more space to do Acropora. Because right now there's all these Acros that I would like to get for my systems that I can't because I just don't have room for them. Okay, simple question. Want to hear your thoughts on getting rid of white spots on glass? I know they're harmless in some sort of worm, but kind of an eyesore. Getting rid of anything on glass is really easy. So uh, I don't use like the magnets or anything like that to clean my glass. I use a metal scraper. Now for the folks that are out there with acrylic tanks that don't do this, they make other scrapers if you're interested that are uh, supposed to be acrylic safe. I don't think anything is acrylic safe, but I use a metal scraper. I don't have time to be messing around with like a ton of effort to clean my glass. So I am extremely brutal when it comes to just like metal shaving everything on my glass tanks. And um, yeah, that works really, really quickly and, eff and effectively. It takes me about like an hour and a half uh, to two hours and I can do pretty much every glass tank in my entire greenhouse myself. The time isn't so much the issue, I just get physically tired doing it. But yeah, when it, after I'm done with that, it's like completely clean. Yeah, and pretty much that's it. It's by hand. That's, that is how you do it. it it's, it's the fastest thing. It, for let's say um, it's a 120 gallon tank. Okay, which I'm gonna guess is like a slightly above average size tank. It should take no more than 15 minutes to make that thing look perfect. 15 minutes, every maybe like three times a week, and it will look perfect. Well, 
What do you think about macroalgae tanks slash display refugiums? Like a tank that's mostly or entirely aquascape with various algaes and seaweeds instead of coral. So I think it is good in theory. I think people come like grossly underestimate how fast macroalgae and seaweeds and stuff like that grow. So what tends to happen is um, one of these guys will take off and will quickly suffocate your entire tank. Um, there's, there's two problems. So one is controlling the growth to, to actually have something aesthetically pleasing and something that won't just choke everything else out, right? Problem number one. Second problem is nuisance stuff is also growing at the same time. So you're not able to have like good herbivores in there because it'll also eat the pretty algaes. So that's going to require a lot of kind of maintenance on its own to get in there and kind of curate that entire look. So I would think that compared to coral, a really nice looking algae tank is going to be a lot more work. A lot, lot more work. But you can absolutely do, um, yeah, you can absolutely do some really cool stuff, especially with like the red algaes and things like that. Ironworks Aquatic. Hi, Than. Sorry, I have to run to the store. No problem. Hope all is well, and that email helped your on your one tank. So, uh, what uh, he had suggested was about hanging lights. Uh, we're still working through that. I think a lot of suggestions that I did receive were about using like a, like a thin steel wire and hanging lights from that, which would work great just to hold the lights. The problem that a lot of people aren't considering is that there's a snake pit of wiring and power supplies and everything like that that also has to be above the tank. And that kind of has to be hidden. And when you have like these really elegant looking like steel wires and stuff like that, it's not just these lights. It's all the cabling involved. And that has to be like worked into whatever design. Gabriel says, just stay away from the corners where you have your silicon seals. True. Also, if you ever have a custom aquarium made, there's a, a thing that you can you can ask them to put in, which is basically a, um, a an additional piece of, of glass at the corner. So you protect the, the outer uh, seam. So even if you were to like aggressively uh, to scrape in there, the seam that you're damaging isn't the one that's holding all the water in. It's just protecting that corner. So, so in my tanks downstairs, they all have those, those uh, protected seams. So for me to like scrape so badly that I've caused a leak, practically impossible. Credit card or sponge is the only thing I'd let near acrylic. I don't trust anything with acrylic. Like acrylic just, it's, it scratches so, so, so easily when you look at it wrong. And there's like algaes and critters. Like uh, we were talking earlier about urchins. Urchins can, can, uh, can scrape up acrylic. And also, um, I think they're like chitons, C-H-I-T-O-N-S. Is that the, those little uh, trilobite looking guys? Supposedly, they have the hardest teeth in like the animal kingdom or something, and those certainly can damage acrylic. You use a Kent scraper as plastic and or acrylic. Yes, Gina, that is exactly what I use. Yeah, I don't like magnets, and um, yeah, it splashes too much. Yeah, I could see that. The, and the, the whole splash thing is why I don't go for um, rimless. I always go for hero brace tanks. Uh, has anyone called you Thanos yet? Yes, they have. Um, and my and my worldview aligns perfectly with his. The end game version, not the Infinity War version. Uh, chillaxing. Than you're going to pull for the Browns this year. I actually am. I'm going to be that fair weather fan.
I'm going to do it. I'm un unapologetically going to follow the Browns and actually root for them after having no faith in them for the last 20 years. Oh, Marcus Aurelius187, thanks YouTube for the 50 minute late notification. You can't trust YouTube, man. I'll tell you what, they, uh, they are not about letting people know that I'm here. <laughs> it's like, I think what, there's like 60 something thousand subscribers to this channel and like nobody gets notified. So if you guys like the content, PSA, to any channel that you really like and you wanna get notified, you have to actually click the notification bell and double check on that notification bell how often you would like to be notified. It, it, that's a, a feature I think on the phone app anyways, that there was like a, like once you subscribe, once you hit the notification bell, there's an option on the no notification bell that actually says notify me all the time, sometimes or never. So somebody has gone through the process of subscribing, hitting the bell to then select never be notified. Thanks YouTube, great, great, great features. Yusef, hey man, got one question. Three LPS core in my tank. Uh, DKH is really low, but calcium is over 500. Over 500, what should I do? Okay, well, the way that, uh, that calcium and alkalinity interact is that sometimes by raising one, you'll actually decrease the other. So what you could probably start to do really slowly is to just dose the part of, of the single part of a two-part dosing system that just raises the alkalinity. And theoretically what that should do, and I, and I say should do because there's all kinds of other chemical goofiness that could be the issue, is that the calcium level will slowly decrease as your DKH increases. Other thing you can do is just more, do more aggressive water changes to kind of like dilute everything more towards what is kind of like what your freshly made salt is. And this is also why I tend to not like uh, reef salts that have artificially high levels of anything is because sometimes what you're trying to do is lower something. And when you have an artificially high level in your salt mix, it's really hard to bring stuff back down because you're constantly having like the surplus of that ion or, or compound. So yeah, I, I would, um, well, you, you might want to like double check what your source water is. If your source water is high in calcium, you might want to look at that, but you could just do the alkalinity component. Like if you're using, I don't know, uh, put BRS cells or B ionic, uh, we tend to use a lot of B ionic, um, and actually we use, of the B ionic, we only use the alkalinity portion. So I've like sold off all the calcium stuff because it's, it's never the calcium that needs to be adjusted in my case. It's always the alkalinity. I would like to know how to get rid of tube worms in my tank. Uh, so cooking hazen, not sure what the tube worms are you talking about. Are they actually feather duster worms or are they fermented snails? Two very different things with two very different answers. Um, let's see. Acrylic is an acquired taste. It's not usually a problem for me, but that doesn't mean I run around recommending it to everyone without making them very aware of what they're getting into. Also, uh, Diacanthus, certain places, glass isn't an option. Like if you live in an earthquake zone, um, so for the United States, that would be like California, Alaska, places like that, you're pretty much stuck with acrylic. I mean, that's, that's it. You can't have a glass tank. Or a friend of mine that's in Japan, you know, after like a, if you're not talking about like a tiny aquarium, like he wants to do like a coral farm in Japan. Uh, guess what? They've got a lot of earthquakes here. Your only option is something either poly, polycarbonate, acrylic, or if you don't have to see through the tank, you can go with fiberglass. But personally, I have to see into the tank. Browns look good. Yes. Uh, they are a drama fest right now, which is not a good thing to have like in, in pre pre season, like summer workouts. We'll see, it'll be something worth watching regardless. How am I feeling? 
I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. I can't complain too much. A lot of positive stuff. It's like all, all the all the stuff that's going on is like hectic in, on one hand, but it's uh, it's people's dream to be having the sort of problems that I'm having. So, what am I complaining about exactly, right? I mean, how bummed would you guys be if you were waiting on giant show tanks to show up? Or how bummed would you be to like be doing any of the stuff that's going on downstairs? It's like, it's awesome. So all the headaches I have, I mean, they are headaches. Like when your electrician screws up and you have to like redo thousands of dollars worth of electric so you can plug lights in. Not the best day, but it's like, your, so your problem is you can't plug in 60 radions? Huh, what a pity. So it's, it's all a matter of perspective, I guess. I feel fine. <clears throat> Sweeping wind, I've chosen notify me all the time and I haven't been notified for the live show. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not surprised, I am not surprised. YouTube is like, hella corporate -y. the minute that like Animal Planet makes a Reef Aquarium show, they're going to have like 6 million subscribers and it's going to be trash. Just watch. I said it first. You heard it here first. Like the minute that some corporate -y outlet makes anything like this, like to make some nature show about anything underwater related, it's going to be like insanely popular. I did one ML Red Sea for a 75 liter tank. My DKH was 6.8. So to be perfectly honest, if your uh, DKH is just at 6.8 and relatively stable there, I wouldn't mess with it too, too much. I mean, if you wanted to creep it up slowly for like over the course of a month, maybe. But as long as your stuff is doing well, I mean, 6.8 is nothing. Uh, the lowest my tanks have ever been was like 2.8. DKH should be closer to 8. So, so there's that, right? What pH test would you recommend for acu- oh, Dude, I don't even know. Uh, pH, I just have a, a meter, like a, a digital meter. Those are pretty, pretty reliable and, and fairly inexpensive and it's, it's a constant number that you can read right there. I've never actually tested pH with like a chemical test. Or I have, but I think I was like 10 years old. Marcus Aurelius, I had a batch of Red Sea before that was 615 parts per million calcium. Yeah, that's not good. No, it does not depend on what you keep. That is so out of whack to have something be that high. And I, I don't know about Red Sea Coral Pro but because I've never used it personally. I know a lot of people who love it, but just theoretically based on how they're producing the salt, you're more likely to get stuff that's like batches that are really high in stuff or really low in stuff. But I'd be, again, more worried about it being too high. In that sense, I almost like how fake my salt is. It's like pure synthetic stuff. Uh, sweeping wind, do you think that the wrong LED lighting spectrum can be the first cause of algae or cyano? Uh, less likely to be the case. Um, no. When you're really talking about algae or cyano, it's, it's almost certainly a nutrient slash chemical issue rather than lighting. Uh, lighting intensity and duration could have a lot more to do with it than spectrum, I would say. Greg Reef Boy, I've been using the Omega Premium Reef Salt that I won from the barbecue and it works great. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I basically I've discovered that only because their rep was like so good. Like Lisa's been great. And 
I'm not like super evangelical when it comes to different types of reef salt. So it was kind of difficult to get the salt that I was usually using. I was like usually using either Instant Ocean or Reef Crystals. It's kind of a pain in the butt to buy that. So I ended up uh, asking, it's like, hey, can you like deliver this to my location in a short truck, nothing more than a 26 footer with a lift gate? And they're like, sure. I'm like, great, I'll give your salt a try. If it doesn't kill off everything in my tanks, I'll keep using you guys. And so, yeah, I've been using it for years. It's not the most popular salt. In fact, I'd, I, would, I would argue that it's on the list of least popular salts, but it's pretty good. The only thing, uh, and any Omega reps out there that, that want to, to chime in, <laughs> um, feel free to. I have noticed that the 180 gallon bucket doesn't make 180 gallons of salt. So it makes a little, little, it makes a little less. And for most people, I don't think that's going to be that big of an issue. Um, but for me, it's like I or, or that, that you would even notice, right? Because previously, I didn't really notice it. Uh, but when you start to make huge batches and you do the math, it's like there's no way that this makes what it says it's making because I have to add in at least another two buckets worth for it to, to get to what I need it to be. So that's the only that's the only knock on it that that I've come up with. Um, but yeah, otherwise it's worked out great. Uh, boss level pops in. I'm new to this. How do I buy? It says auction sale. Do I buy it now? How much is shipping to Indiana? I know you're not far from me, like four hours. Fortunately, your closeness doesn't help at all. Um, we have a flat rate shipping. It's $39.99. And the way that you purchase corals is you go to TitleGardens.com and there is a link to the live show. Or you can just go to TitleGardens.com slash live. And so, for example, we're on item number 121 right now. So if you wanted it, you just put it into your shopping cart and check out just like it's a regular item. And you can mix and match stuff from the live show versus the website itself. Um, yeah, so during the live show, things can get competitive depending on the time of year. Like winter time is way more competitive than the summer, so that's working out for you. So I always recommend it's a good idea to check out with every single item that you want just so somebody else doesn't check out with that same item before you. And when you do that, you don't want to be constantly paying multiple instances of shipping. So um, you, just as the shipping option, select adding to an existing order. And then once you're finally done, either you pay once for the shipping module or once you're over $250, it ships for free. And on that live show page, there's like a, an FAQ that kind of like goes over everything I just talked about. Have you ever read nitrates or ammonia from a test kit from Omega? Uh, I read reviews that claim they did. Uh, I have not tested it. I read reviews that they had ammonia or nitrates. Um, that's possible, but I, I have not had that issue. And for some reason, I think I heard that when it comes to like ammonia and nitrates, um, just in general from, from any salt, I think it changes the longer you wait also. Like that might be one of the initial reactions when um, you make a new batch of salt water and then that all gases off and it turns into like your regular salt. Uh, sweeping wind, uh, NO3 is stuck at 25 parts per million. Parts per million. It's a little high. Uh, some months ago they were at two. A little low. <laughs> Not knowing how much phosphate I have though. Sailor for test read zero. Okay, I like Sailor for test kits. Um, I don't think anybody really likes their phosphate test kit though. Um, bought a Hannah tester for PO4. Yeah, you might want to go with that rather than than the Sailor for because the Sailor for is basically like 
either you have phosphate or you don't. It doesn't give you a whole bunch. Of it comes to an algae issue, a sweeping wind, I'm not really certain that it's going to be a nitrate issue as much as it would be like just a general phosphate and feeding issue. I would just do one more additional water change to whatever it is. So, redlining this thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm having like bad connection issues. 